Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembry. And I'm Janice. And this is Quick Study Television, a program designed to take you through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation in one year. Now, we have a team together, and we've studied things, and we're going to figure out what we're going to look at today. Corey is part of that team. Corey, what's up? Today, we are going to be looking at what ancient Israel might have looked like during the reign of David. Excellent. Very good. Now, you studied today. Yes. What did you find? 2 Samuel chapter 5, we're going to talk about the Jebusites in Jerusalem. Very good. The Jebusites who thought David couldn't take over the city, which uh -huh. they later called the city of David. So that's interesting. Ryan, what's up? Well, today we're talking cosmology. Did God really say that the sky and atmosphere is a solid structure? Is the Bible presenting an old and incorrect cosmology? Is it really? That's a good question. We'll talk about that and more. Plus, later on in the program, we're going to talk about David fulfills the commands of God and the elders make him king. Two different events, and we'll talk specifically about that and how to uh, determine from that what God is saying to us. Right now, it's time to get ready, so get your Bible guide out in your Bible. It's time to study. Here comes Corey. Not long ago, archaeologists began work on a small military outpost that dates to the time of David, just to the time of David. It didn't seem to exist before or after. So let's take a look at this potential garrison town of David. In 2007, excavations began at Kerbet Kayafa by archaeologist Yosef Garfinkel, who claims he wasn't setting out to find King David but that's exactly what he believes has been revealed. The ancient city dates to the 10th century BC during David's reign. Much to the chagrin of scholars who dismiss David as more of a tribal leader, excavations have revealed one of the most impressive fortified cities of biblical times. The walls are estimated to have stood six meters high and still stand two to three. Its walls were casemate, meaning double walls, and made of huge boulders. Only covering about six acres and holding a population of perhaps 600 people, this city was a type of guard against David's western enemies, the Philistines. A most telling discovery is that this city had two gates, which so far is completely unique. This has lent intriguing support to the theory that this is Shearim, a city associated twice with David in the Bible, and its name means two gates. The location and dating of Kerbet Kayafa fits neatly within the biblical record. It seems as if David's kingdom is more like the Bible's description than skeptical scholars would like to admit. Yet still, the intrigue isn't over. In 2008, an ink inscription on a pottery sherd was discovered at the site. It is the oldest example of Hebrew writing to date, and it records an ethical point of view advocating protection for orphans, widows, and foreigners, and enabling the king to accomplish such things. It does not quote scripture, but it parallels so closely passages in the Law and Prophets. This shows that David's kingdom was not only established, but supported scriptural thought with a literacy level that proves books of the Bible could have been written in this early period. Some things to keep in mind when taking a look at history and archaeology is that the Bible frames out a lot of history. It tells us what we need to know, and it refers to and alludes to uh, contemporary history of, of the time period. So when it's writing about David, it'll refer to different cultural practices, but it doesn't necessarily explain all of them, nor does it uh, necessarily uh, tell us about every city that David had commissioned to build or every garrison town that he stayed 
that, simply because that would be extremely exhaustive. There, there, the ancient books had to be short. There wasn't, a, you know, scrolls were expensive. Making leather for that was expensive. So it, the Bible tells us our need to know details, uh, not only so that we know uh, a history, a working history of ancient Israel, but more importantly, that we get the theology of God. We can understand the personality of God and how he's interacting with his chosen people, Israel. And that demonstrates not only for modern Israel, but for the rest of the world, what God is like. And it shows us parts of his personality. So uh, keep with that in mind, ancient history and uh, the practice of archaeology can really reveal many things uh, that aren't put in the Bible about the culture that is portrayed in the Bible. For example, this potential garrison town of David. You know, a city claims David is not a threat. That is Jerusalem, the city, then ruled by the Jebusites. Now the Jebusites, they make a statement. They say, you shall not come in here, but the blind and the lame will repel you. Second Samuel 5 and 6. Now they speak too soon. And thus begins the city of David that remains to this day. You see, David authorizes a contest for his men to conquer the city through its waterways. And they take the Jebusites by surprise. This is Jerusalem of today, the city of God. Now, God chose to place his name in this city, and he will rule from here in the future. Now, throughout history, Jerusalem is the most valuable piece of property in the world, not because of the past, but because of the future. Second Samuel chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. Then all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and spoke, saying, Indeed, we are your bone and your flesh. Also in time past, when Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel out and brought them in. And the Lord said to you, You shall shepherd my people Israel and be ruler over Israel. Therefore, all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron, and King David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. David was thirty years old when he began to reign, and he reigned forty years. In Hebron he reigned over Judah seven years and six months, and in Jerusalem he reigned thirty-three years over all Israel and Judah. And the king and his men went to Jerusalem against the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, who spoke to David, saying, You shall not come in here, but the blind and the lame will repel you, thinking, David cannot come in here. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, that is, the city of David. Now David said on that day, Whoever climbs up by way of the water shaft and defeats the Jebusites, the lame and the blind who are hated by David's soul, he shall be captain and chief. Therefore they say, The blind and the lame shall not come into the house. Then David dwelt in the stronghold and called it the city of David. And David built all around from the millow and inward. So David went on and became great, and the Lord God of hosts was with him. 2 Samuel chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. The amazing thing about the Middle East is they have cities there that, cities like Jerusalem, that are famous and amazing. And we think about this from their past, but we don't think about it from their future. 
The Bible tells us in the prophetic works that Jerusalem will be where Jesus Christ returns and comes back and he rules from Jerusalem on the earth for a thousand years. Now that is amazing. And that's an interesting city today. It's the only city in the world divided up into fours. But anyway, it's fascinating. And we're going to study that now. But if you have your Bible guide, that's great. If you don't, make sure that you write to us, get a hold of it because you can't get it in bookstores or anywhere else. You can only get it online at BibleDiscoveryTV.com. That's our website, BibleDiscoveryTV.com. Send an offering in any amount. We'll be happy to send it to you. Now, as we study this, we begin to ask the question, the city of David, what, what is this city of David business? And, and how did this start? And what is it that we're trying to figure out with the city of David? There's a place called the city of David. In fact, in the Bible, it's called the, the city of David. And it's amazing because as we look at this, we begin to understand what God is doing. God is focusing on a city upon the earth where he will rule in the future. And this is Jerusalem. We're going to read 2 Samuel 5 to 8. And we're going to look at 2 Samuel 5, 1 to 10. And it's important that we pay attention because God is speaking here and this all fills out in the prophetic and it fills out right to the end of Revelation. And it is stunning. So we're looking at Jerusalem. Now in 2 Samuel chapter 5, verses 1 to 3, the scripture says, Then all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron, this is after Saul's dead, and spoke, and they said, Indeed, we are your bone, we are your flesh. Also in the time past when Saul was king over us, you were the one, David, you were the one who led Israel out and brought them in. And the Lord said to you, you shall shepherd my people Israel and be ruler of Israel. Therefore, all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron and the king David made a covenant. He made a covenant with them at the Hebron, at Hebron before the Lord. And they anointed David king over Israel. This is amazing. David fulfills the commands of God. The elders and the leaders of the nation make him king. Listen, God rewards us appropriately. <laughs> I mean, you can't, see, they, they didn't see when, see Samuel, remember Samuel, when Samuel was alive and David was a little boy and he comes in from, you know, his father says, well, these aren't all of them. There's one more. He's out there. Go get him. He brings him in and brings in this little guy and Samuel anoints him. That's David. That anointing was finally fulfilled. And they anoint him king as the elders, but he's already been anointed. So that is amazing. That anointing when he was a young boy was done in secret. And so now this anointing is done in public. That's amazing. And so we go back to this now. They begin to recognize who David was. David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned for 40 years. In Hebron, he, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months. In Hebron, he reigned over Judah. And in Jerusalem, he reigned 33 years over all Israel. Now that's different. And Judah. And the king and, and his men went to Jerusalem against the Jebusites and the inhabitants of the land who spoke to David saying, now here's what they said to him. You shall not come in here, but the blind and the lame will repel you. Thinking, well, David cannot come into Jerusalem. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, that is the city of David. Now David said on, the th on that day, whoever climbs up by the way of the water shaft and defeats the Jebusites, the lame and the blind, who are hated by David's soul, he shall be chief and he shall be captain. Therefore say, the blind and the lame shall not come into the house. Now this is stunning. And as we look at this, we understand that David rewards his faithful men with the title chief of captains. You see, God rewards with his rewards. And that's so important. All these men who fought with David for those years that, that David was not 
the king of Israel. He was running for his life. And those men came to him and they, they fought with him in over Ziklag and all these other places. They did what David desired. And that was the catch. David was anointed king of Israel and king of Judah. And David says, I'm now going to reward my men. I, th I think that's amazing. You know, God will reward you if you are doing something that nobody sees, but the Lord has called you to do it. If you're working somewhere that's very small, but you're witnessing, God will reward you. Then David dwelt in the stronghold and called the city of David, called the city of David, and David built all around from Milo and inward. So David went on and he became great. And the Lord God of hosts was with him. Something you need to understand, David reigns in Jerusalem for 33 years. God rewards, his rewards are good. And let me tell you something, when God rewards you, you're going to know that it's God rewarding you because the rewards that come from God are not from this world. And there's only one place they come from, and that is the hand of God. And let me tell you something, you know, you can have money rewards, you can have everything else. The rewards of God are different. They are very, very powerful, and they enforce you for eternity. That's amazing, and a lot of people don't realize that. So many people are focused, you know, on life here, but God is rewarding us and preparing us for life in the eternal, life in the forever. That is so important as we see this today. Now you will notice as, as you read and study through the books of 1st and 2nd Samuel and 1st and 2nd Kings that many place names are mentioned, but something else is used as a geographical guide and that is geographical markers like the Dead Sea. The lowest accessible point on planet Earth is the Dead Sea. Positioned along a major fault line, the Dead Sea is appropriately named. It is so salty that sinking is almost impossible. Boats can't stay in its waters for fear of corrosion, and there are no fish under its surface. This unique lake receives an estimated 6 million tons of fresh water every day from the Jordan River, other tributaries, and even seasonal flooding. But it has no outlets, so its water content is balanced by evaporation. Due to mass amounts of evaporation, the water left in the Dead Sea has an enormous mineral content, comprising 25% of the water's makeup. Average ocean water is around 6%. This means an absence of aquatic life, yet a major source of essential minerals. The sulfur smell of the Dead Sea has proven a siren call to those suffering with skin and health conditions for thousands of years. As an enduring and unique land feature of Israel, the Dead Sea is mentioned many times in scripture, referred to as the Salt Sea, the Sea of the Arabah, or the Eastern Sea. Around its shores lie diverse archaeological sites, beautifully lush and getty oasis, hideout of David, and major tourist attraction. The ruins of Qumran, a site famous for its involvement with the Dead Sea Scrolls. Masada, ancient fortress repurposed by Herod the Great, turned graveyard of Jewish rebels in the first century. The speculated ancient ruins of Sodom and Gomorrah, an ancient Roman road visible during dry spells, and even the biblical city of Zor, to name a few. Relatively recently, another justification for the name Dead Sea has been explored. This area contains the world's largest graveyard, dating from before the days of Abraham until the 6th century AD. At Quick Study Television, our passion is to help you learn and understand the Bible along with us. Our goal for 2016 is to expand to new television and radio stations, add more helpful materials to our website, and continue to produce innovative products to help people of all ages study the Bible. 
None of this would be possible without our faithful partners, both financially and prayerfully. Thank you so much. If you are currently not a partner of Quick Study, would you prayerfully consider teaming up with us so that we can continue teaching the Word of God? If you would like to become a Quick Study partner, please call our office in the U.S. at 724-733-8336 or in Canada and the rest of the world, 519-940-8338 or write to us. And remember, no gift is too small. Next time on Quick Study Television, we are going to study the following. We are going to look at David must fulfill his covenant. And so get ready and join us next time on Quick Study Television. Right now, here's Ryan to tell us what he's talking about. Ryan, what's going on? Well, today in Did God Really Say, we're going to deviate from our reading and head back to the book of Genesis, because Genesis is the most attacked book of the Bible, hands down. It's true. And today we go back to Genesis chapter 1, where critics claim that it says that the sky and atmosphere is a solid structure or dome. This idea was accepted by many astronomers thousands of years ago, but we know today that it's wrong. But did God really say that the sky is solid? Critics of the Bible accuse the Holy Scriptures of being full of errors and contradictions. Especially criticized is the very first book called Genesis. Indeed, among other things, Genesis has been repeatedly attacked for allegedly having a very unscientific view of the universe, one that reflects the cosmology of the ancient world. For instance, critics point to the word firmament, meaning sky, atmosphere, and outer space in Genesis 1, which can be found in several English translations of the Bible. The argument made is that the word firmament connotes the idea of firmness and reflects the ancient cosmology that the sky was solid with the stars actually embedded into it. However, this is simply a translational issue. The original Hebrew word is rakia and has been translated in certain other English translations as expanse. The question is, which translation is correct? Where did the word firmament actually come from? In the 3rd century BC, the Egyptian pharaoh requested that some of the Jewish scholars in Egypt produce a Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures called the Septuagint. This translation rendered the Hebrew word rakia into the Greek stereoma, which does connote a solid structure. It appears that these Jewish scholars had accepted Egyptian cosmology, which embraced the notions of the heavens being a stone vault. This in turn influenced Jerome, who produced his Latin Vulgate around AD 400, and translated the word stereoma into firmamentum, meaning a strong or steadfast support. Consequently, firmament is a transliteration of this word. This demonstrates the danger of allowing one's personal beliefs to be placed higher than the Holy Scriptures. In looking at the Hebrew word rakia, we discover that it actually means to spread abroad, stamp, or stretch. It appears that the author was not making a comment on the density of the rakia, but rather the stretched out nature of it. This is evidenced by two things. First, we read in other places in scripture that God stretches out the heavens. And secondly, in modern Hebrew, rakia is the word used for sky and in no way connotes hardness. So here we see another example of an alleged contradiction that's nothing more than a translational issue. However, this investigation does illustrate perfectly how our personal beliefs can become a problem if placed in higher authority than the scriptures. Consider that the word firmament came about from an incorrect rendering of the Hebrew word rakia, and this incorrect rendering was a result of placing the popular science of the day above the Bible. The Bible can teach us many things, including about the cosmos. Very good. Thank you, Ryan. Excellent work. Uh, Very good. Look forward to these segments. Anyway, what did you study for today? Well, today we were looking at 2 Samuel chapter 5, and of course we're talking about the conquest of Jerusalem by David and his men. Now, the Jebusites were in Jerusalem at this time, and they had held at least a district of Jerusalem since the days of Joshua. And they thought that their city was invincible. But in verse, that's in verse 6 that we learn they think they're invincible. And then verse 7 says, Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, that is, the city of David. Now, Zion is a poetic name for Jerusalem. But here's something interesting about the Jebusites. In the list of the descendants of Noah in Genesis chapter 10, we find that the Jebusites are traced through the line of Ham and Canaan. 
Very interesting. Now, yeah. I, I was just noticing that you mentioned Zion is the poetic name for yes. Jerusalem. Yes. And there's a lot of people today who are against Zionism. Yes. And so that means they're against Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And they don't think about that. It's important that we understand and that we know uh, what these things are about. That's right. Very important. All right. Well, we need your help and we need to continue here. And how you can do that is you can write to us. We have our offer, of course, this month. But right now I want to talk to you very closely about our help that we need from you. It is time that we say, you know, we need new partners. And so the new partners, you can write to us at BibleDiscoveryTV.com. That's on the internet. BibleDiscoveryTV.com, and you can speak to us there. And by the way, you can get the Bible Guide, the digital Bible Guide there as well. And we actually put the, the various forms of the Bible Guide on, but if you write to us, then you'll get a hold of it. Also, you can write to us at P.O. Box 150. That's Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. You can give in any amount there. So when you write to us, make sure you give. Now, you can support us either on uh, by asking for the Bible Guide or by not asking for the Bible Guide, but we do need to hear from you. And also, in Canada and the rest of the world, P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. Make sure you write us there. The most remarkable thing in the world is when God chooses us to rule in His place. This happens at the end of time. There are people redeemed from sin, individuals different from any other in the kingdom of God, according to the Bible. They know what it is to be captivated and captured by sin. They know what it is to be freed and healed from the sickness of sin. This is the new song that they will sing when they achieve heaven. Our best life is not now, but in the future, when through Jesus Christ we overcome all the effects of sin. Not too long ago, there was a person who said to me, you know, Rod, I invited Jesus Christ into my life, and when I did that, my life changed. This person was an alcoholic somebody who had trouble in alcohol and drug abuse. And God totally changed them because they believed in and trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. You can do the same right now. Jesus Christ died on that cross 2,000 years ago, and he rose from the dead, seeing over 500 people. Invite him to come into your life and be your Lord.